Okay, so we'll start with introductions. So on the far left, from my far left, your far right over here, we've got Nate Beck. Can you tell Hi. me a little bit what you do? Uh, so I, uh, I co-founded a label called 99 Lives. Um, and then also created a music player for Twitch streamers called Pretzel. Um, yeah, that's me. And then the gentleman in the wonderful purple beanie. Yeah, that's me. Hi, I'm Noah. I'm a lawyer, but I'm a cool lawyer. Um, oh. Hey. No, he's not. I'm both of your lawyers. Exactly. Anyways, so. You're my uh, lawyer, too. Yeah, exactly. Um, I'm a video game attorney, and I specialize in intellectual property law and uh, business law, which, you know, dovetails perfectly into what I love to do is play games, so. Awesome, and this wonderful gentleman to my left is Ryan. Uh, I run uh, all the A&R and uh, basically curation for the record label 99 Lives that Nate mentioned earlier. And I'm also was director of music for the music app Pretzel and now I'm a director of client management uh, over at Song Trader a music distribution company. Awesome. You're also an artist. You are also an I artist. I am also an artist, uh, Made Monster, who almost played the last MAGFest, but it would, there was no MAGFest. There so was no MAGFest, yeah. We didn't get the yeah. headline, so well, you might see us at the next one. Also, yeah. real quick, so that we don't go through the next three years wondering what A&R means like I did when I first met you, what does A&R mean? I like to call it artist relations, which is the new... It's the technically new? artist the and new. repertoire. No. Yeah. Repertoire is too vague. And uh, to my name question. is Heather. I am the CEO yeah. of 99 Lives. And I'm also on the board of directors uh, at A2IM, the American Association for Independent Music. And I am going to be the one asking these wonderful gentlemen the questions. It's terrifying. Very terrified. OK. So to get started, I think one of the most important aspects here is the background. So what is the background here? And why is copyright such an issue especially now that it's becoming a little bit more popular to stream and, and on top of doing YouTube content and TikTok, like all of these platforms are at play. So, you know, tell me a little bit more about the background. Yeah, so typically right now, uh, whoa, what just, just set that down anywhere. Yeah, fine. Um, the, uh, the problem that we're having is that copyright underlies everything that we're doing in the space. It underlies the games we're playing, the music that we're playing, underlies the content that's being made because copyright means literally when it, copyright occurs when somebody when something is fixed in a tangible medium of expression so when you create something you create a copyrightable item and so what is happening is a lot of folks are creating copyrightable items using other copyrightable items and articles and so what is happening is they're it's essentially running into a lot of infringement where proper parties aren't being compensated anyone else have any more context about how we kind of got where we are? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that, yeah. It, it's also very, very interesting when it comes to music copyright mm -hmm. because music is actually broken up into two different distinct copyrights. And so you have one half is called uh, the composition or the musical work, and that is the song, the lyrics, the melody, uh, and those pieces. And so normally those are managed by what, uh, what are called publishers. And then the other half is the actual recording of the song, which is known as a master. And that's your MP3 file, your WAV file, the actual first time that it was ever, you know, fixed to a tangible medium. Yeah. And so, you know, if you come up with lyrics to a song, that would be the song and the publishing. And if you, you know, uh, my, my favorite example is the song Happy Birthday. I don't own the song Happy <laughs> Birthday, but if I recorded myself playing a kazoo version of Happy Birthday, I would own the recording of Nate playing the kazoo, but I don't own the song Happy Birthday. Right. So it's kind of interesting to keep those distinct, but normally those rights are controlled in the commercial music industry. They're controlled by completely different companies. Right. So. Yep. And so along with copyright, we hear the term DMCA a lot. Does anyone want to break down what DMCA is? I think uh, Noah should. Yeah, I think it's the lawyer. The lawyer. <laughs> so the DMCA is the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. It's not the boogeyman under the bed or anything like that. And so it's, it's only for millennials? It's not just for millennials. <laughs> <laughs> How many times have I been asked that? Specifically by you. Um, anyways, the, uh, so the Digital Millennium Copyright Act was an act passed by Congress, the United States Congress for those on YouTube, 
um, that uh, essentially was created to react to how things were being created on the internet. Um, the relevant provisions that we have here are the safe harbor provisions and the notice and takedown provisions. So the safe harbor provided a safety net, so to speak, for you know sites like Google to be able to allow for user-generated content to be uploaded. For example, if you take a photo and you upload it somewhere, Google image search is going to grab it. And so that is content that you've put on the internet. Now, if you actually just steal somebody's photo and upload it somewhere and Google image search grabs it, the person who owned the original photo is going to want to sue Google and not you because Google has much more money than any of us in this room. And if that's not true, see me afterwards. Um, and so that the way that the, the DMCA kind of operated with a safe harbor was they created a safe harbor for Google in that case. Basically, if safe harbor, uh, if, the, if Google received a notice that, uh, that there was infringing content, so content that was uh, owned by someone else that's not authorized to be up there. If Google receives a notice from an authorized rights holder, the person who owns the content, that there is infringing content on, uh, uh, on a service provider, uh, platform such as Google, Google must then take down that content in good faith because the, the noticing party has sworn under penalty of perjury that they have a right to police and control that content. That is what we call a DMCA takedown. That's what you hear about on Twitch, on literally everywhere, Spotify, everything. Um, now, in generally, the, the person who uploaded the content has a right to file a counter notification, meaning they say, hey, I actually have a right to put this stuff up there. This person's wrong and you need to reinstate it. At which point the service provider then has to reinstate the content within a certain amount of time. Unless they receive notice that the person who originally filed the first DMCA takedown has initiated a lawsuit against the counter notifier. That gets really technical and detailed. But what you need to understand about that is that the DMCA is a tool. It's not inherently good or evil, although people up here disagree with that, including myself sometimes. Uh, it's a tool by which um, service providers are able to respond effectively and, and uh, clearly to takedown notices. Mm -hmm. I feel like we should make a DMCA skit we for like explaining gosh. that whole process. It's tough because it's, the, it, it gets so it gets so Illinois. in the weeds about who does what, when they do what, et right. cetera. But yeah, the the whole point of you know the DMCA was when was it, Heather? Was it ninety seven, ninety eight, ninety eight? Yeah, so it was before YouTube was even a thing, mm -hmm. and so we're taking laws from then and now applying them to new use cases. So live streaming is a really interesting one that, you know, uh, we're getting into right now. Whereas, you know, YouTube and Cobb, YouTube is much more established. They have their content ID system that's in place. Yeah, YouTube already had their reckoning, which is something that you actually kind of taught me yeah. about back in the day. Back in 2007, 2008, yeah. The Michelle Fon stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, I yeah. think it's important to note that the DMCA definitely had a purpose, um, mm -hmm. specifically around the age of the internet growing and starting to gain traction. The goal was to provide a, a, a different type of interaction between rights holders and the platforms so that they weren't stuck to just battling it out in courts. The idea was that if you remove the content, then you're no longer in violation and therefore no legal penalty would be held against you. And while it might be outdated, it definitely had good intentions and a good purpose. And I think that gets forgotten sometimes. Yep. Um, I'll, I'll pose a question to you. Just uh, Would you say the DMCA has now kind of morphed into more protecting the platforms and the big tech platforms than it is protecting the artists? Yeah, right now DMCA best serves those who have a lot of money. And whether that's a, um, whether that's a, uh, a situation where somebody, you know, a, a small rights holder has, you know, has their, the right to upload something and then a big platform or a, a big corporation files a DMCA against them, and then you know they, they can have a counter that gets fought out in the courts. Whoever has the most money, you know, has to deal with it. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. I mean, kind of. It's yeah, I agree. It's who can make claims, but it it, it very. So in two thousand and when did the report come out, Heather? 
2020. In May of 2020, um, the U.S. Copyright Office, they started working on a report. Oh, they started in 2015 and they released it in 2020. Yeah, they did. Okay, so yeah, and so five years. They took five years to do a report. They interviewed all tech platforms. They interviewed all different rights holders. And basically what Congress had commissioned the U.S. Copyright Office to do was to basically answer the question, does the DMCA strike the balance that Congress intended when they wrote the DMCA in 1998? Right. And so they took five years, did all these interviews, did all these things, and put that report together. And it's it's a long report. I think it's like 72 pages. It's incredible. 272 pages. 272 I read all of pages. them. Whoa. You're yeah. like 200 short. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a very long report. Does and so anybody up here read it? Heather read it. I read through. the whole thing. <laughs> Two out of four. So the thing is about um, what they came up with that is they came up with about 10 different um, actions they felt that they could take and then they're going to work on those actions over the next decade. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but what they actually found in the report is that companies like Amazon and by proxy Twitch basically were saying, you know what, the DMCA, how it is exactly today, works perfectly fine for our needs, doesn't need any changes at all. Um, let's keep it exactly how it is. And so it's because it puts the burden of policing on the rights holder. So really what we're talking, they're, they're saying, you know, if the, if the rights holders, the people who own the music actually want to enforce their copyrights, they're welcome to scan all of YouTube and they're welcome to scan all of Twitch mm -hmm. and uh, find all that stuff. And so when they finally start doing that, then you have Twitch come out and is like, oh, they're attacking us and saying all this. We're stuff. under attack. So if you have like a small, more independent record label without all the finances in the world, you end up playing more of a whack-a-mole. Yeah. Right. This, this people, especially if you have popular content or if you have mm -hmm. a... A use case where you let people, content creators, use your things in the, in the space of YouTube or things like that, where you allow people, then you know you're spending your entire time basically taking down other people stealing your music across the different platforms, which a, a label of any size doesn't want to spend their time on. So then, what's their what's their option? Just let it just let it get rampantly used. And to that point, you know what is. Jeez, this is Dude, like, can you move that cable off of your? It's the it's, table. It's the, it's the table. table. Oh, it is. Um, okay. And what is kind of arisen in the in the content creation space, especially on Twitch, is that there was no for a long time there was no good way to police when music was being uh, used in an infringing manner or un without authorization. So, uh, content creators got in the habit of saying, "Hey, you know what? It's working. I'm not getting in trouble. This must be okay." And for the long, a long time, Twitch actually had in their in their guidelines, hey, you know, you know, covers are okay and stuff like that. It was very loosey goosey, um, and so that's a legal term. That is a legal <laughs> term, allegedly. Um, and uh, the and so what arose was this culture of yeah, it's probably fine. And then when the technology came out that allowed at least the massive labels to come through and say, oh, actually. You know, we're going to do all these takedowns, 500 a day for six weeks, whatever. It unleashed chaos because creators didn't have a really good method that was publicized at the time. And I'll, that's a nice gift um, <laughs> to uh, listen to music on their streams. And for creators, just, just to be clear, music is an inherently important part of these content creator streams. It creates ambiance. It is, it is the background of their stream. Sometimes it's in the foreground, like when they need to take a break or something like that. It is, it is a, a crucial part of content creation. And so having a, a li properly licensed way to go about incorporating music into content creation is, in, is in, intrinsic to the future of content creation. Yeah, it's, it's really difficult. Um, yeah, it is. Well, so, so with Pretzel, the way we address this, is that it's the the problem is that there's a lot of manual effort so remember we talked about how there's two different parties there's publishers and record labels that don't generally are not the same company and if you go look at a drake track a drake track will have 19 songwriters each with their own publishers and basically you have to negotiate with like seven record labels and you have to do all of that to clear one song. There's like 52 rights holders on God's plan. It's crazy. And so 
And the problem is, is if you are even even if you are a large streamer on Twitch, the amount of money that you can actually pay for a license for a song, unless it's like your intro or for background usage, right. it's only going to be like two or three hundred dollars for the license, just because you're going to use so much background. That's like the very high end of what the market will bear, and so you end up to be you end up having this thing where it's not worth the time of all of those publishers and all of those record labels to negotiate those deals. And so what we did with Pretzel is, you know, we have about 600,000 users. And so we negotiate on behalf of our 600,000 users with those rights holders. That's what makes it so that we can actually, they're willing to take us seriously and negotiate with us because we can pool those resources together. And collectively bargain. Yeah. Would it be fair to tell them what Pretzel is? Yeah, that might be <laughs> sure. Pretzel is um, what we have for dinner. Mm -hmm. That's a joke. That. I mean, yeah. This Whenever is why I you don't let lawyers to. tell, so, tell sorry. jokes. Pre pretzel is just pretzel.rocks. It's like a Spotify for live streaming. Um, and so, but I don't want to turn this into like a whole pretzel panel. No, just, like, it was just relevant yeah. because you were referencing pretzel a lot. Yeah. yeah. So uh, every, everything on the pretzel platform is legally licensed to be on Twitch platform. So yeah. it's it's basically like a DMCA safe Spotify for Twitch broadcasters. Yeah, and then we have a smaller subsection that's YouTube safe, which is difficult because that it, the gentleman it, up at the front. I'm curious. Oh yeah, go ahead. With the awesome hat. <laughs> um, yeah, so we're we're just about to hit four hundred thousand tracks, uh, and we have um, we actually have I, I think it's close to in terms of actual tracks that we have partial rights acquired for is somewhere closer to like 20 mil. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so the, the tricky part like Nate was bringing up with the Drake example is on the publishing side. It's on the master side, it's usually record labels owning 100% of the rights to this music. Yeah. And we've cleared close to, Nate was saying, close to 20 million songs yeah. on the master, master side. side. But since Pretzel considers the use of Twitch a sync, which I'm getting too deep in the weeds on that, basically, mm -hmm. The writers of the music, as well as the pre people that own the masters, both need to get paid. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So nothing goes live on the player unless both sides are Perfect. being paid. Uh, and so we, even though we got 20 mil of that one side, we still need to figure out how we're going to get all the rights cleared on the other half. And that's one of our big challenges. Fees? I'm sorry, what? Is that just an upfront licensing fees? Oh, no, no. 20, well, I think they're, what they're saying is 20 million tracks. No, yeah, yeah. But, but if you need to negotiate with competition. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah we, we, we generally don't pay. Do uh, Pretzel doesn't pay advances or anything on any of the deals that we do. So, um, yeah, we only pay actual usage, just like a DSP does. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, yeah, we don't, we don't pay anything out up front for the licensing. I think, um, I think uh -huh. one important aspect, too, here is that, um, you know, there is a desire from the music industry to work with content creators. Yeah. And so they're willing to forgo things like advances yeah. um, to, but the problem that they have inherently run into is that the music industry is notoriously poor with tech resources. Right. Um, even when they do have them, they don't know what to do with them. And with the exception of a handful of the majors, not all of the majors even have the proper resources to do this type of licensing. Um, they've just never seen a way forward. And so there's an interest, it's just they needed a tech platform to kind of do the work and pretzels one of the first ones that's come come forward with it yeah and at the end of the day one of the things that i, I like to bring up to creators is that your content creators streamers on twitch is that artists musical artists musicians are creators too and just as someone on twitch wouldn't want all of their revenue diverted somewhere else uh, a musician wouldn't want their revenue diverted as well. So it, it is in the best interest of all parties for these to all work together. And so finding a platform on which they can work together to the mutual benefit, finding a win-win is incredibly important because without the licenses, then the broadcasters are infringing. And I'm happy to sit up here and say that all day long. It's going to piss some people off. Yeah. Um, but they are. It's just no way around it. Some people say, oh, well, you know, it's fair use. Well, not really. And fair use is an expensive defense. If you don't know what fair use is, I have a panel tomorrow that's going to ask me anything. Um, I'm not ready for it today. <laughs> um, and so it's in everybody's best interest to work together, figure out these licenses, and, and move forward. So, Yeah, it's... Um it's really interesting because there, there's another way to solve this problem. So the, the real trick of what 
we're trying to solve or how we how we work on stuff is you know 99 lives is a record label where every single thing that we sign on 99 lives we we buy out the ownership of both the master and the publishing in perpetuity so we, mm-hmm. we buy that out so that we can then give content creators their own in perpetuity um, licenses in perpetuity licenses because when you put a video on youtube you want that license for that music to last for the entirety of the video living forever and so the music industry if you ever use the word perpetuity they'll they immediately mostly, run out of yeah. the room because they they won't negotiate yeah. well and also keep in mind that you know the music industry itself is migrating away from in perpetuity artist agreements right, right? the yeah. idea of owning an artist content forever yeah. is fairly intrusive and there's laws within countries like the uk and even in the us that at 25 year 35 year mark yeah. they can fight for their rights back so granting a license in perpetuity it's going to have to be something that you know content yeah. creators adjust to that not existing because we as record labels we may not have the rights to give you yeah. in perpetuity well and you see that you see it happen in video games too like alan wake was taken off of stores at its 10 year mark because the music licenses in Alan Wake expired. And so they had to close the game and then they remade, but they remastered it and brought in different music with different licensing to, to pull it in. But uh, what I was gonna say is with uh, 99 Labs, there, there's a ton of really good um, musicians in the indie space, especially they're, you know, Approach Nirvana and Big Giant Circles and- Main Monster. Main Mo- Monster. <laughs> Chipsel and, and um, Zircon, like there's a whole bunch of, I mean, a lot of people here, right? Popsky, there's, there's fantastic indie artists who understand the value of working with streamers. And so giving them a platform uh, as well is, is one of the other pieces. So it, it's, that's one way to solve it. Harris Heller does it with Stream Beats where, you know, he owns all of that stuff and then gives the stuff away, uh, gives the music away freely for uh, use mm-hmm. on, uh, use in content. And right. so... That's one way to do it, but then that that's we, we generally we call that catalog music or production music because it's not top 40s that you're going to hear on the radio. It's not Taylor Swift. It's not Drake. And so we call that stuff commercial music. And so what we're trying to figure out how to do is how to kind of get both commercial music and production music licensed in a way that is a win for everybody. Right. Makes it fairly painless for both yeah. parties. And lawyers, we're having a lot of fun with it. Um, oh my gosh. Because, you know, while the top 40, they want to be in on this in some, in some cases, they want to work with content creators. The lawyers for the top 40 come to me and they say, well, we can't give this to you. That's insane. And we'll say, okay, well, we can carve out this thing. They say, well, what if, you know, Honda comes along and uses pretzel to make a car commercial well that they're not going to do that here here's why but they have all these concerns and so it's a matter of communication and talking and making sure that expectations are set too mm-hmm. so you guys kind of like covered my next like four questions all in that like sprint so i'm going to kind of migrate over because we've talked a lot about you know the content creators how to what could they can do to safely use music uh, what do industry professionals do to protect their IP? So I think one of the other pieces here are the platforms. Mm-hmm. And inherently, as a record label, as a member of a I I will tell you over and over again, we get stonewalled so hard by the platforms. You know, we've asked them to build tools for us mm-hmm. that allow us to meet halfway, kind of like content ID system like YouTube has. And a majority of them just don't want to budge. They mm-hmm. don't want to meet halfway. Um, yeah, so we get we get stonewalled by the platforms quite a bit, and so I'm kind of curious, like your guys' experience and with working with the platforms. Yeah, well, the the thing about working with platforms and and especially figure out you know try and get Twitch to license music properly, <laughs> is like trying to lead a cat through a hamster maze. Oh, so. Um, and I'm saying this on a recorded panel. Um, I, I love you, Twitch, but come on, man. Um, the the thing is, Twitch exists because of copyright infringement. Mm -hmm. It is built on the backs of people using works that they don't have a license to use to make content. Uh, I mean, uh, who was the last broadcaster you saw on Twitch that went out and got an express license to play Escape from Tarkov? (laughs) They don't. They don't do it. And so if, if Twitch acknowledges you know, this is a problem, then their entire platform, this multi-billion dollar platform, that's right, right? Multi-billion dollar, I hope. 
Um, I, is, know money. Reach, I, I, I know they've hit one billion. I don't know if they've hit two. At least one billion dollar platform um, is at risk. And so one, they don't want to cough up and start paying for licenses because they're worried about the domino effect of, well, you know, I paid, you know, this company. Well, then I got to pay this company and then this company. And then the publishers of games are going to come around and start circling like sharks. So Twitch has so much built in resistance that that's why indies like 99 Lives, incredible indies, are going to get stonewalled at every turn. Well, it's also, yeah, I'm glad to bring up the game side of it too, because it's like we, we've seen a few examples where copyright enforcement on the games themselves on Twitch mm -hmm. have been. So we saw it with Persona 5, where the studio basically said, you are not allowed to go past this certain time period in Embargo the game. Dates. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, like in the game, you're, right. not, you're not allowed to go past this time because it will spoil the story and we don't want people spoiling the story. And so, you know, they, they literally said that. And for people who, People who went over it, um, uh, getting over it. When yep. Bennett Foddy, same thing. At the, when you get to the top of the game, there's a chat room that you get to go into. And if you, you would, you, there's literally a thing that says, I am not streaming this chat room publicly. In the, yep. who was it? It was, um, I don't remember who it was. I remember somebody, somebody did stream it. There's a large streamer who got in there and then immediately got received a DMCA takedown from the game developer. Um, for using his content in a way that was against the terms that he gave. And so another one that we actually saw that was, this is a while back, but uh, there was a, um, there's a League of Legends streamer called yes. Faker. Yep. And uh, he had a deal where he could only stream on the Azubu platform in Korea. Right. And so people wanted to watch his gameplay. And so there was a, literally a Twitch channel called Spectate Faker which all it did was a program that whenever Faker's tag came online and started playing, you could spectate other people in the right. League of Legends client. And all it did was streamed Faker's perspective from that game. And they actually shut that channel down because of DMCA. Right. Uh, but League had to deal with that. Mm -hmm. And so because League of Legends owns the game, the there's a really, I would actually be interested to hear your thoughts on this in terms of just like that. Cause, uh, why why is it that game copyright is tied to the games and my understanding of how it works is that if you have an algorithm mm -hmm. no matter what input you you own the copyright of the algorithm no matter what input you put into the algorithm the output is copyrighted to the owner of the algorithm and that's why video game rendering mm -hmm. is actually uh, video game rendering is actually owned by the game developer, regardless of what inputs you put into the controller. Yeah, so so every underlying part of of the game is going to be owned by by the rights holder, whether it's the publisher that's been assigned to or the developer itself. Right. And so um, what? And that's exactly it. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you, you just hit the nail on the head. I, I can't explain it any better. Than that. <laughs> um, um, but what also just kind of a weird tangent on that is that gives really interesting rise to like why esports as a whole are kind of falling apart because you know as opposed to real sports like 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 dirt sports like baseball nobody owns baseball but you know they Blizzard owns Overwatch and so they can literally control exactly who watches it and there's no competition. Yeah, it's really interesting. I think that's one thing, and I'm kind of curious what your guys' thoughts are, but there's one thing that's like different about, because you get the idea, you know, if the music's playing on the stream, it's like, well, you're promoting it. Does that, doesn't that offer some sort of compensation appropriately for music? And there, I think there's a, because they do it for games and you see game sales go up. Right. I think there's a distinct difference. I'm kind of curious your guys' thoughts on like why it's different from the music aspect as opposed to from the video game aspect. Yeah, I have a lot of thoughts about this. Um, yeah, you usually do. Yeah, it's true. You always have lots of thoughts. Um, yeah, I think the big thing about talking about kind of what, what a conversion is for these things. So let's think about it just in terms of um, just like standard marketing. So you have terms like CPC, which is cost per click, or CPM, which is cost per milli, which is how many how much it costs to get a thousand impressions on a thing. And so with a video game, um, everything's about, or, or with any type of marketing, it's about conversions. Mm -hmm. And so if I spend a hundred dollars in marketing, and let's say I get 
10 conversions from that. So I spent $100, I got 10 conversions, so my cost per acquisition was $10, $10. Per, per acquisition. Now, let's say I'm promoting Among Us, the video game. Well, that's a $5, it cost me $10 to acquire a user, the game costs five bucks, and so there's $5 there. However, the game has in-app purchases and all these other things, and so even if I spent $10 to acquire the user, even though the five, I can generally make my money back on... The user's worth more than what they spent on the game. Right. And the what a conversion is for music yeah. has changed in the last two decades, right? No one's buying CDs anymore. Nobody's buying iTunes downloads. There's a handful of people who still buy vinyl and a handful of people who will buy the digital downloads for, you know, off of Bandcamp to support the artist, which is the best way, by the way, if you want to support an artist. Please buy on Bandcamp. Band yes, please Band buy on Bandcamp. Band Band but if, if what we're talking about doing is, okay, I'm gonna go listen to that music, and a conversion is, I'm gonna go listen to that music on Spotify, that person's gonna get 0 .003 cents. It's 0 .0003 cents. Yeah, three zeros and a three. They're gonna get not much. And so, at that point, if, you're, if your conversion rate is, you know, if your conversion rate is you know, I'm going to pay $1,000 to acquire a bunch of users, but every time they convert, you're going to get 0 .0003 cents. They maybe listen to it two or three times, but you're only going to make three cents mm -hmm. off of these conversions as opposed to even Among Us or in-app purchase or any of these other things. And so it really comes down to what is, what is the product of music? It's not a $20 CD anymore. It's not, you know, any of these things. And so it's been commoditized. And to be honest, I see the same thing happening in the game industry. At yeah, least with is. the game, with like Xbox Game Pass and all these other things, you're going to start to see these subscription things that drive the value of video games down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, it's going to be really interesting to see what happens with this music streaming platforms, the way um, the fracturization that the traditional media platforms have. So right now it's like, okay, well, is my thing on Netflix still? Oh, well, maybe not. I have to go watch it on Peacock. If I want to watch right. The Office, I have to start jumping around. I fully anticipate that's going to happen in the music streaming space, too. Yeah, and I, I agree with that. No, yeah. I completely agree with that. I think with the majors right now, especially, you know, majority of the driven traffic is to Spotify. Right. If uh, the majors took a cue from what's happening with, you know, all the, you know, CBS is a streaming platform and all the what cable is happening, if they pulled their catalog, like Universal pulled all of its artists, all its musicians, and created its own, D uh, own downloadable DSP, like its own Spotify, and then Sony had one, and then if you want to hear your favorite artists, you're going to have to buy all three. Or the bundle. You get the bundle. Or the bundle. Or it moves back to digital purchases. So this is, you're seeing now a huge uprise mm -hmm. in people instead of, like everyone who's been cutting the cable, right? Cutting the cable and then going to, well, it was Netflix and Netflix had everything. And then Netflix and Hulu, now it's Netflix, Hulu, Disney Plus, Peacock and everything else out there. So what's happening is people are now going to Amazon Prime and, or Amazon Video and they're going to iTunes and they're just buying the just straight up for 20 bucks, buying the seasons so of the show it. that they want. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what I do for Rick and Morty. Like, oh, yeah. I don't have TV, I just go buy Rick and Morty on iTunes. It's, it's like they knew from cable that the average consumer was okay paying like 100 to $150 right. for TV. So they're like, all right, if all of us together subscriptions in a year yep. are close to that we range, we can, we, can, we can do it. So uh, it, it's very cyclical. Yeah. Like I think, I think music's gonna get back to it too. There's gonna be fracturization of music and people are gonna go back to owning their music and not leasing it. Well, and also one, one of the things that you were talking about was you know, the, the super low cost that you know, the people, the musicians aren't getting paid very much for those clicks. And so right. acquiring users um, uh, is one of the reasons why it's important for the music industry on the flip side to work with content creators. Because for one, I mean, I, I'm not sitting up here and saying, oh yeah, they should do it for the exposure. I'm not, I'm 100% not. Um, but what I'm saying is the content creators should pay to be able to use that music in their stream. But the artists, the musical artists, should want to do that because, and we're going to talk about this on a panel on Sunday, um, what the content creator doing is, is creating an experience and they could have emotional connections to that music based on a stream. And every person in chat 
is going to hear that and have a certain reaction to it, which will lead them to say, oh, hey, I really like this song. For example, I, I, you know, I manage a band that's on Pretzel. These two are going to groan as soon as I say this. Uh, I manage a band that's on Pretzel called Turbo Mansion. They're here at MAGFest. And they, we released a song, a tra an album for them in March of 2019 on DistroKid. And it went up to Spotify everywhere. Didn't get any views. Like, you know, they, they are a local Richmond band. It was getting a few listens here and there from their friends. Gets on Pretzel. And it's played all over Twitch. And all of a sudden, they have like a fan base in Germany out of nowhere that they've never met um, that listens to their music regularly. And so it's about creating that experience. Because if, you, if you're exposed to the music somewhere, then that person's going to remember, hey, I really enjoyed listening to that song at that moment. What was that song? Let me go listen to it. It's part of my repertoire now. I want to touch on something Nate said earlier about going back to owning music and kind of bringing back, since we're kind of talking about copyright a little bit more. Uh, so if Nate, if I buy the Drake album, don't I, don't I own it then and I can put it in my content? No. <laughs> no. You but have I, just I own it. purchased the license to listen to the master. That's yeah. all you've done. It's in my, it's on my hard drive, Heather. <laughs> I own you, it. For personal listening. Yes. Read right. the terms and conditions of iTunes. I yeah. have. I bought a video game and I'm allowed to play it on Twitch. Read the terms and conditions. Oh, no. <laughs> that's, not, that's not how it works. Um, that's not so how it works. that's actually a really good, a really good um, uh, kind of a segue. We're talking about up here about two different things. One is the right to stream the music, and the other is the right to you know, own a physical product. Now, if you buy a literal CD, you, have, you own that CD. They cannot prevent you from listening to that CD. Um, however, if you receive a license to listen to that CD, then you can be prevented from that. You can have that license revoked at any time because you don't own that. What if Drake tweets me and says it's okay to play his music on my screen? <laughs> I'm going to walk out of this panel. <laughs> no, seriously. Drake, Drake tweeted me. He said, I can play God's plan in my Twitch stream. Did he also tag all of his producers, writers, record label, and publishers involved I, in that tweet? Yeah. It's, it said hashtag YOLO. <laughs> I... I look forward to, like <laughs> yeah, I've seen, I've seen this a bunch where people are like, oh, the person tweeted at me. I'm like, I'm waiting for the day for a tweet to be admissible in court. Right. As like, oh, yep, that's that's permission. Yeah, right. It's, it's going to be one of those things. Hopefully where... not with one of my clients, because if we get no. to that point, then my clients messed up a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, like what? What are the terms? What's the expiration of like? Right. What's the term of the tweet? Is it in perpetuity? Like, the, like the whole point is you need to have legal agreements in place to dictate the terms of your relationship. And yeah. so, you know, and to kind of dive into that a bit, like if so, so if you go out here and you know, Twenty One Savage tweets at you and says, "Yeah, you can listen to my music on stream." That's great. One Twenty One Savage doesn't own all the rights to do that. Done. But let's assume that they did. Then. Uh, that tweet is missing a lot of key terms. Yeah, okay, you can listen to my music. That's uh, an implied, well, that's an express license express to use license. it. However, is it revocable? How long can it stay up? Can he, does he have to give notice if he revokes that license? Can he just wake up one morning and be like, you know what, screw that kid, and then revoke it and issue a DMCA? The answer is yes. Yeah. So tweets are, oh, not... Twitter is just also a pit. But yeah. <laughs> you also forgot to assume whether or not he even owns his compositions. Yeah, exactly. Because right. you're dealing with sync, which involves the composition. So it was very interesting looking at um, another thing that happened with, uh, like PewDiePie had a video where he dropped the N word and all this other stuff. In Firewatch, a, the Firewatch videos. Oh yeah. No, 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 it wasn't in the Firewatch videos. It was in a right, PUBG right. game, but the developer of Firewatch, Campo Santo Games, yep. Just was like, you know what? I'm fed up with this guy and his privilege and stuff. So he, he had, even though he was the game developer and it was a year old video, he actually revoked the license for PewDiePie to use the copyright for his game and issued a DMCA takedown, legitimately. Yeah. And so, and he didn't have to give any permission or anything because that's the funny thing that game dev game developers right now hold all of the keys mm -hmm. because people are infringing their content with no licenses whatsoever right which means that the favor falls on them and so th if people are going to stream your game regardless of if they don't have a li if even if they don't have a license then all the terms are on your side right and now, so now what's interesting about firewatch in this particular case so just to kind of recap it fully 
PewDiePie played Firewatch a year before, right. dropped, dropped an N bomb on PUBG, bad thing to do. Um, and the Firewatch developer had a license on their website that said, you can play Firewatch on your stream and upload Let's Plays and VODs. And however, that's all it said, essentially. And they said, well, you know what? Yeah, we had that license. It's now revoked. And so we're going to immediately revoke it and DMCA all the content, which is within their rights. Now, this is where I actually have to stop and say everything that I'm saying up here is <laughs> for informational purposes Please only. It's it not legal specific advice. legal advice. Your situations will almost always be different. Yeah, hold on. <laughs> it is being recorded. It's um, and so, I'm an attorney, not your attorney. I'm an attorney, but I'm not your attorney yet. <laughs> you, you are mine. And I'm literally all three too. of your attorneys, yeah. um, but not y'all's yet, as far as I know. Um, and uh, and so, you know, make sure you consult an attorney in, a, in your specific case. But in this case, for informational purposes only, um, Firewatch, the Firewatch developer was perfectly within the rights to do that. And it, it was bad PR for everyone involved, but they could do that. So, so touching on that and what we were just talking about with the whole the major labels maybe starting their own DSPs, do you ever think of, of the video game companies potentially? Like, you know how you, if you're an Xbox, you buy an Xbox, I don't know, Game Pass or Gold right. Pass, whatever it's called, to play other games online. Do you ever think of that would make an upgraded tier to that? Like, an Xbox Stream Pass, where the video gaming companies all got together and said, you know, we're going to start charging for this. If you want to stream our game, you want to you want to play, you know, PUBG or whatever on like you you're going to have to pay this extra on top streaming thing that they can work out through the platform. I mean, yeah, I, the Just marketing can of the marketing is so well. Among Us wouldn't be a game as if it was without content creators, yeah. right? Among Us was a game that existed for two years prior to it having its ascendant rise to popularity, right? And that is all from YouTubers and content creators on Twitch, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's what rocketed it all the way up, and then became super popular and, and and kind of took over. You know, you see that with a lot of games. Fortnite had the same sort of meteoric rise. Minecraft had the same New York rise, um, you know, and so the real trick to Fall Guys too. Fall Guys did a really great job with that. Um, and Tim the Tap Man with Fall Guys. Right. Well, I mean, it, it's one of those things yeah. where it's like there is benefit to it, but I think when it comes to copyright, it really comes down to choice. Right. Uh, the copyright holder is the person who gets to make, t to have the final say about how the work is used. And so. Fair use is a really interesting one because, as a defense, but it's a very interesting thing because you're basically saying, well, no, I'm allowed to commentate or make a, you know, use it for educational purposes or any of these other things the way fair use works. Make it transformative in some way. Right. And so, but it really comes down to, you know, you, go, you don't get to tell someone else what you can do with their work necessarily. Right. And so, um, yes, being like, oh, it's exposure and they might be okay with it. But it's still their right and their choice to choose how their work is used or how their work is displayed. I, I actually think, Ryan, that that was a really great question because, one, you're looking at it from the, the side of um, a streamer saying having to pay for a streaming pass, which is, which is uh, you know, that's been contemplated. I can right. confirm that without saying exactly who. However, um, the flip side of that is part of the reason why Twitch is so terrified of paying the majors for licenses. Um, or historically they have been, because if the major labels get paid for licenses, why aren't the major publishers getting paid for licenses? What's the stop Blizzard, besides the horrible PR they're dealing with right now, um, from going and saying, oh, you know, Overwatch, now streaming exclusively on Facebook gaming, uh, besides the fact that it would kill Overwatch again. Well, it, um, already, it already did, right? Yeah. They, they sold exclusivity licenses for, for the, the Overwatch League. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But I'm talking about like entirely. It mm -hmm. game just exists on Facebook gaming now. Can't stream it on Twitch. You'll get a DMCA. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. And, and that is something that a lot of major game publishers have considered too. But they don't want to fight that war yet because they're benefiting from Twitch. But the minute they're not, that comes into play. And that's what you were talking about, Nate, about the value of video games being suppressed. So maybe it gets down to a certain point. Yeah. Then they can get more money with that kind of licensing. They might pull the right. trigger. Well, it's been it's it's become very clear that a subscription, we were we all were very resistant to subscription based billing when it first came out, right? Yeah. When when Creative Cloud, Adobe's Creative Suite went to a subscription based model, it was. I mean, a lot of people are still really against it because it feels like a I'm leasing my software. I'm not buying the software, and that feels right. really not great. And like I said, it's going to be cyclical. 
we're going to come out of this subscription cycle and people are going to want to buy ownership or buy those things again and then they'll get tired of buying everything again and they'll go back to because then you got to buy the updates instead of just getting them right and so i i actually think it's going to keep it's going to go around again you can't dmca and a track what's that you can't dmca and a track <laughs> I mean, you could try. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I did want to just kind of wrap it up with one last quick thought. And then um, I wanted to make sure we answered any questions that sure. anybody had. But so given everything that we discussed, what is the future of music? And now that we're kind of talking about gaming, but game broadcaster partnerships and relationships. Amazon buys all music. We have to pay the commissions. Is it? Pop of purple. Um, I think that it's got to be symbiotic. Otherwise, it's going to be a nightmare the way that it has been over the course of the last year and a half for broadcasters and for musicians. Um, uh, musicians and broadcasters have to work together. And they also need to tell the musicians and the broadcasters don't know, just need to work together. They need to make their voices heard. Because a lot of musicians don't, like we've said, don't own the rights. They need to tell their labels. They need to tell their publishers. They need to tell everyone hey, we want to make this work. And you need to figure out a way, way to make it work and stop looking at the dollars and cents now. Invest in the future of this collaboration instead of what, you know, what your Q4 is going to be. Um, I think they're going to get there. Um, I think we've made some strides. Uh, however, I still think that the lawyers, because we're all jerks, are going to get in the way at least for a certain point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I'm very hopeful for where we're going. Um, with, with licensing, it's there's music is inherently valuable, and so it, it needs to be treated as such. And for a very long time, the val with with not just live streaming like Twitch, but like streaming and Spotify, the value of music has been really, really degraded. It's been cut in half, and it and it makes it very difficult for musicians to be able to make a living doing what they love, and so. Spotify, I'll, I'll leave it with this, the, and I don't think Spotify is the way to do that. Um, and a big part of that is Spotify says they want to have one million middle class artists, middle class artists on the platform. But if you actually do the math of that, mm -hmm. um, you, you actually a million artists with the entire royalty pool being paid, it means that they would each be making twenty thousand dollars. That's twenty twenty. That's a million poverty art level artists. Right, and so it's just there's. If you took that, I, I can't remember exactly. I have to look up the actual thing, but yeah, it's the mathematics on it simply don't work. Right, and so it's an unachievable. Or no, I think it was like the GDP of the world right. divided by a million and stuff, and they each get twenty thousand a year. So if that's if every artist gets paid with that, anyways. So it's not really it's achievable not unless unless people start paying and supporting artists. So like I said, pay, support artists, support, you know, their band camp and use Apple Music. You need to yeah. stop. buy their merch. Buy we, merch. We need to stop seeing people treat um, music and content creation as a commodity, yeah. but instead have it be treated as something that's intrinsically valuable and should be supported as such. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um any questions from anybody specifically? That guy. What, what does DMC stand for? Oh, Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Uh, it is it is the notice and takedown provision by which the world runs right now. That is one Article part 15. of it. Yep. Okay. Article 512. Article 512. Yeah, that's right. And there's one other, like section. Se what, it's section four, 512 or something. That's section 512. Yeah. Yeah. There's there's a lot to the DMCA. The most relevant aspect for most platforms is the notice and takedown, which the platforms love. If you ever feel up for it, go read their report uh, mm -hmm. by the U.S. Copyright Office and look yeah. at the notes. And Amazon, YouTube <laughs> sent, I think, each 20-something odd comments, and all of them are in favor of keeping the DMCA in its current Oh, yeah. State. Like, the, the premise of hashtag the DMCA is broken is a very odd one because if the platforms have their way, nothing should change. Uh -huh. They don't want anything to change. And so a lot of people are like, oh, Twitch, you need to prevent, protect us from all this stuff. And Twitch is literally, not Twitch, Amazon is literally like on record stating like, nope, it works perfect. Nothing yeah. needs to change. Please don't change anything. We're going to lobby Congress to not change anything. anything. Yeah. And, and on that note, you know, one of the, the people that would have to change it are by their nature lawyers. And yeah. right now, 
as a lawyer, I can tell you we benefit from how the DMCA is set up. Um, I don't think it's necessarily good, but it's just complicated enough that we can charge to do it. The there's worst. Some, there's some pretty cool things that are coming down, though. So, like, um, the, the CASE Act is one that's yep. in oh, Congress God, that's right awesome. now. So mm -hmm. that one is... Small court copyright claim. Yeah, so so essentially, it's something that's really big in Europe. They're trying to bring it in the U.S. right now. But right now, if you wanted to protect your copyright, if you, you're an indie artist and you actually want to, to protect your copyright against somebody who stole it from you, um, so like you do a DMCA, then it takes down. If they counterclaim you, your only option is to sue them. Yeah. And so you're, and we're talking about suit in federal court because it's a federal copyright law issue. And so we're talking about what? $5,000 to Five? start just to file so the paperwork. So what's really important to note is that that is actually a misnomer. It does not say you have to file in federal court. It just, okay. it's a federal question. Um, and that's all I'm going to say on it because that's a trade secret. <laughs> but essentially, you know, the, the concept of the CASE Act is that uh, if you're below a certain size, you can actually, it's almost like small claims court for copyright issues. Mm -hmm. And so you can take, and it's limited on how, how much money it can be and a lot of those other things that you can do. So right. I'm actually really hopeful that the Case Act stuff goes through because that's going to help. You know, we, we deal with it, or you deal with it, Heather, with 99 Lives, where we have people who just take the 99 Lives music, distribute it on DistroKid, and then claim it's theirs. We I actually sue use those guys. The yeah. We've actually used the DMCA to protect content creators because we actually try to make sure that our stuff stays protected in content ID systems. Um, and so that means we have to control it and we make sure that every single use is, you know, permitted and yeah. the claims are released and that nobody sees a mute. And when someone steals our music and uploads it through DistroKit, it gets entered into those systems again, but with a different policy. Um, and typically with a claim policy or a mute policy. So we spend a lot of time, um, actually spend a lot of Noah's time chasing down people that love to steal our music. Um, and I find them. We find them all over the world. Yep. Uh, any other questions? We got too much. So we'll try to get them both in before yeah. we close in yeah. five minutes. Uh, so you mentioned when you were talking about press that you got a second that is uh, YouTube second music as well. So yep. Because yeah, that's a good question. It's a great question. Yeah. So, ex so repeating that question for the recording, essentially, um, the question is: Nate mentioned that Pretzel has a YouTube Safe option, and what does YouTube Safe mean? Yeah. Yeah. So, great question, by the way. So, um, for Pretzel to for a track to be YouTube Safe and Pretzel. It means that we, Pretzel, control the content ID ownership of that asset in YouTube's content ID service. Yeah. And, and they make sure the claim is released. And the policy for that track is it's called route for review. But what it does is it actually um, no claim should be made on that track. And so we have a system. It's, a, it's called Aegis, which is an automated system that every single day checks the status of every single asset that we own, manage in Content ID. Um, and if it ever goes into a reference overlap or an ownership conflict or any of those things, it actually gets pulled from YouTube Safe and Pretzel until that thing gets gets fixed. And so and sometimes... If, yep. And if the other party makes a claim, we release it. Yeah, yeah. So, right. so the safe part is actually for our users, right? The content yeah. creator knows that that's it, that music is safe for them to use on YouTube and they won't get demonetized. Yeah. Correct. But it's a much smaller catalog. So like we have 400,000 tracks in normal pretzel and about six, 7,000 tracks in YouTube safe currently. Give it a month. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we're expanding that. <laughs> we'll be yeah. up over 10K soon enough. But yeah, it, it takes time because it does require that huge extra piece of it. Yeah. Great question. Yeah. Last question. That one. So yeah, the question is um, if if YouTuber removes uh, a video for under the DMCA. Um, and they received a report that the um, 
the uploader of the video did not have permission to upload that video, but in fact the uploader did have permission, is YouTube in the legal right? Well, so great question. On the under the DMCA, YouTube is doing what they're required to. If they've received a notice that um, that content is infringing and whoever's uploaded it does not have the right to upload it, they got to take it down, um, and they have to do so in a timely manner. They got to do it pretty quickly. Um, however, as part of that, YouTube has to provide that notice to the uploader. So with enough specificity, and usually they just copy, copy and paste it to them, um, but with enough specificity that that owner can determine, oh, hey, this is what the video is. This is the specific content that was claimed. Um, do you want to respond? And in that case, and again, this is for informational purposes only. This is not legal advice. If a content creator actually has the right to use that, they can counterclaim because in theory, uh, and they can counterclaim because in theory, they can, they can show them. proof that they actually do have that license. Right. So that would be an actual good use of a counterclaim. At that point, the person that submitted the takedown would have no choice but to file a lawsuit against the, um, against the person who uploaded the video, to provide the proof of the lawsuit down. to YouTube to keep it down. Yeah. Okay. That, that's where mistakes kind of can happen, right? Where it's like, oh, well, I did have a license. That's why that counterclaim process is in there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's also, there's always concerns on YouTube with, you know, people uploading, uh, you know, people issuing false DMCAs and right. a lot of this stuff, which is a, it's perjury. It's a, oh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a crime. It's, it is straight up illegal. <laughs> if, if a rights holder does it, it's a crime, you can actually sue, technically, if yeah. they claim ownership of something. The rights holder has to, but like, for example, anybody that stole Nine Night Lives music and then issues DMCAs, they I could technically sue them for yeah. for that. And that, that stuff does happen. Um, I mean, to be perfectly frank, in the YouTube system, uh, that stuff happens far less than actual rightful uses are identified. Yeah. So... Cool. Thank you. Thanks, Thank everybody. You. Good question. Um, if you guys want to know where you can find us, uh, socials. Oh, uh, 99 Live on everything. Do 99 Lives. So. And uh, check out Pretzel Rocks, pretzel.rocks. And mm -hmm. you can find me on Twitch, Twitter, and TikTok at my lawyer friend. Awesome. And if you're curious about music curation, we have another panel. I think most of us are on it. Yeah, uh, we're all, 10 all on it. Plus 30, one more. 10 30. 10 30. So we're going to go to the bar and then we'll see you there. Yeah. <laughs>